So Brad's going to talk a bit more about Nautilus as a complete trading system. Nice. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so this is just from, I'm just going to talk a little bit more from like a, a, a user's perspective. So Chris has talking, uh, talk, spoken pretty extensively um, about sort of, I guess, the theory, the architecture, the, the motivations and history for, for Nautilus, um, which is very interesting. It's great for people to know um, where it's come from and sort of how it's gotten to where it is. But as, a, as an end user, I think there are, you care more about concrete examples and and you know, sort of how you would go about using the system, I guess, um, as opposed to sort of pr probably developing for it, which is what is a lot of the um, the previous slides have sort of been about. So, um, I'm calling this section is I might just share my screen actually. To, um, yeah, sure. Just for a sec. Uh, yeah, I will. Uh, excuse me. Can everyone see that? Star Wars. Star Wars. No, not Star Wars. Excuse me. Uh, see that now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So I've just, I've called this section um, Nautilus as a complete trading system or like why wouldn't you use XYZ trading platform I found on GitHub. Um, and so from a, from a user perspective, um, Nautilus has a lot of features that make writing trading strategies quite easy and quite enjoyable. Um, so when normally when people, whenever I sort of bring up a backtest uh, or talk about backtesting in Python, people typically say, oh, you know, what about your order fills? What about um, latency to the exchange and, and other things? So Nautilus supports a lot of models for um, uh, simulating what, what happens in real life in a backtest. Um, and so some of these things will make your backtests um, more realistic than they would be otherwise. Um, when you send an order in Nautilus, um, there are a lot of different order types are supported. Um, so uh, different time in force, stop, profits, stop losses, take profits, bracket orders, you know, one cancels other, all of these sort of advanced order types that may exist on different brokerage platforms or exchanges you can implement in your backtest. Um, among other useful things. So one of the things we implemented recently is order tags. And so you can assign arbitrary um, key value uh, items to an order. So this might be useful if you wanted to say tag orders as opening or closing a position or tag them with some sort of um, information about like your, your model that um, generated the order. So if you thought you were selling some product because you thought you had some edge, um, you might assign that edge to an order and that makes running analysis downstream on, you know, which orders made money and which, which orders you lost money on quite easy because these tags flow through to your positions and are sort of linked to your fills and various things. So when you come to do um, analysis post the fact, um, tags makes that very easy. I might just add, Brad, on the orders. Yeah. Um, we don't just have market orders and limit orders. Like a lot of APIs and platforms are, are limited to those. Um, all the order types really are built from either market or limit orders. Uh, and we have everything from market to limit, uh, trailing stops, um, and, and quite a few more. Nice. Um, accounts. So um, this is actually a little bit of an area that needs a bit of work, but um, Nautilus supports both cash and margin accounts um, and, and is, is there to be extendable to other types of accounts that people may have on, on various venues or exchanges. Um, I sort of mentioned positions before, but uh, Nautilus supports uh, netting and hedging, which if you don't know what that means, it's, it's not a big deal, but basically um, different exchanges or venues use different models for if you open and close or if you do a buy and a sell, what happens? So do you have a net zero position or do you have two, two different orders? And Nautilus supports um, both kinds out of the box. Um, along with... Um, a lot of components that make things easy. So Chris, Chris mentioned the, the cache earlier um, and I'll mention the portfolio as well. So in your trading strategy, you have access to this, this global portfolio and this global cache. So when you, if you want to know, if you want to say in your trading strategy, part of it may be querying for some sort of information 
um, that the system may have. So that might be um, the number of orders you have in the market or your, your total position size in some particular product. The portfolio and the cache make this very, very simple. It's very trivial to just pull up a list of your open orders or your closed orders or your current portfolio value and a bunch of things because a lot of trading strategies typically use these values or these, these sort of events um, in their logic. So Nautilus makes this very, very easy, which is, which is really um, makes, makes writing a trading strategy quite straightforward rather than having a whole lot of boilerplate code required to do something that should be quite simple. In Nautilus, it is quite simple. Um, persistence. So this is again something that um, we added uh, not so long ago, but um, basically Nautilus spits out um, we, as you feed data through the system um, and as events are sort of happening, the, this data is flowing through the system um, and it's possible to persist every single piece of data for, for sort of post analysis. So all of the, the quotes and trade ticks and every order event that happens, position event, account events, all of this is can be persisted um, so that you can open up a Jupyter notebook after the fact and view in very, very fine grained detail exactly what your backtest or live trading um, node has done. And I spoke about the cache. Um, yeah, we've, we've spoken about actors a bit, um, but I really, the, the um, actors really allow, um, We'll, I'll cover a concrete example of where you might use an actor in the pairs trading strategy, but actors are sort of like you have some functionality that you think is quite isolated and you would like to possibly um, extract it from your trading strategy. Um, this could be like fitting a model and having that model produce predictions. That's a really good candidate for an actor. So um, I think someone in the chat asked about um, integrating with like um, scikit-learn or TensorFlow. Um, the, the the strategy and the actors are just Python code. So you could you basically would um, you would implement your model in in either your trading strategy or an actor. Um, and the yeah the, the the actors can be can interact with quite a lot of the system um, in the way that they're sort of they're built and the access that they have via the message bus. Um, so you can do a lot of powerful things with them. And we'll get to an example. Sorry, Brad. It's okay. worth mentioning that strategies are actors, they're a type of actor just with additional order management uh, methods available on them. That's right, yeah. Uh, and yeah, we've spoken about the message bus, but again, lots of flexibility for sending messages throughout the system or, or sort of fan out pub sub style messaging. Um, so actors and strategies can connect and listen to or publish events and data very, very easily um, throughout the system. Um, we spoke again, spoke about custom data, but this could be like market statistics or yeah, Twitter feed, very like anything, any sort of data that you think might be relevant to making a trading decision. Um, it, yeah, it, it's possible to get it all into Nautilus very, very easily. Um, the risk engine. So the risk engine sits in front of the um, the execution engine. So all orders that are sent go through the risk engine. Um, so we have a couple of risk checks that sort of stop you from doing um, the disastrous things that you know a lot of people do when they start writing trading strategies. You know the leaving a for loop in your code and spamming 10,000 orders a second. Um, these sort of things will be blocked by the risk engine. So it has, it can be modified further, but it has sort of sensible defaults that, you know, you can only send, I think it's currently a hundred orders per second. It probably should be less, but it will, it will block you from doing, from basically blowing up your account and can be configured in a way to be much more um, uh, restrictive than, than, um, than what it currently is. Um, but it gives you a little bit of that safety that, you know, if you, if you do put a bug in your code that um, Nautilus will, you know, uh, can protect you a little bit. Yeah, Max National. Yeah. Um, and then finally, um, probably a really, a, a quite a good um, uh, sort of feature that we haven't really mentioned yet is um, the clock and time events. So um, this, I, I was like super impressed with this when I, um, when I first came across it, when Chris first showed it to me. So um, both the, the back test and the live um, trading nodes uh, have, have an internal clock. Um, and so the back test is as it sort of moves through time, incrementing this, this, um, this back test clock. 
Um, and when you're running live, you have this a live clock, which is just your computer's clock. Um, and you can basically trigger events on uh, a periodical timer or for, for times in the future. So this is super handy um, for an event-driven system because there are times when there actually may be no events happening and your strategy may rely on doing something you know, at some sort of time interval. So it could be that you are trying to achieve a VWAP um, price on something. So what you want to do is just try and do a little bit of your trade once per minute, or you may have some particular functionality that operates either at the start of the trading session or the end of the trading session. So some people have trading algorithms that do particular things um, towards the end of the market close. And there is the the internal clock makes it very easy to set time events to do certain things. So, um, and the the most impressive like that's that's quite good. But the most impressive part is that it all works um, in a back test too. So again, uh, sort of going over the 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 prod back test parity, um, the back test clock works exactly as you would expect it to work um, in a back test. Uh, running on replay data, uh, which which yeah, I really thought was super impressive. Uh, it's not something I've ever seen in a in a backtest system before, um, and and I've used it a couple of times. It's quite useful. So it's worth mentioning that every actor and strategy has access to the clock. Uh, so there's like an abstract clock and two implementations: test clock and live clock. Live clock under the hood now has a monotonic clock uh, in Rust. So we actually just take a snapshot of the system time at the beginning, and then there's uh, users in instant to measure nanoseconds from that point. Um, and also worth mentioning that it, it's available to the user, but it's actually, it's, it's very efficient and it's used internally by components such as the uh, throttler um, and bar aggregators for internally aggregating bars as well. Um, I will, Pass back over to you now, Chris, as well. Sure. Okay. Oh, that's where you left off. Fast forwarding. Oop. Uh, we're back on current state of Nautilus. Okay. Forward. Thanks. Forward. Yep. Current state of Nautilus trader. So. <clears throat> Someone said to me a while ago that you know when your project is being used in open source when the GitHub issues start increasing. And we've definitely been seeing that in the, in the last sort of few months. Um, so there's definitely people using the platform, particularly for backtesting. Um, and I know there are some people using it in production. Uh, we've heard of someone using it for trading uh, Korean equities. Um, Brad has used it live for sports betting. Um, I know of several crypto firms that are integrating it into their systems for backtesting and experimenting with live trading. Um, so it is seeing more adoption, basically. Um, and there are some areas we do want to improve that need a bit of polish, uh, particularly around accounting. Um, I really need to go back through there and do some refactoring, uh, particularly for margin accounts and sub accounts. Um, I think that whole part of the system can be improved. Uh, and configuration and deployment, because we've mainly been back testing with the platform. Um, we haven't polished the live deployment solution quite as much. Um, and we do provide a, a Docker image, um, just a, a bare Nautilus um, install basically, uh, to be used as a base for other people to write their own images with their custom functionality. But we don't actually yet provide much guidance of best practices for deployment um, and configuration. There's quite a lot of configuration and we are about to talk about configuration uh, and how that's handled probably particularly for live trading and over the wire can be improved as well. So a bit of a user guide now. Um, so what this is leading up to is me uh, showing you in my IDE uh, crypto backtest. So it'll be on um, ETH US dollar T uh, spot. And then I'll actually run uh, some systems on crypto exchanges as well. 
Like, so, so just sorry, Chris, did you mention the Jupiter Lab there? No, I, I just clicked it. Do you want to talk about the Jupiter Lab? Um, yeah, maybe just quickly. Um, yep. So, and I think we actually got a little bit more before the demo um, on the config, but we, we can do either or. It might be time for a demo. We've been talking a lot, but I'll just give a quick spiel on yeah. this. So, yeah, um, yeah to, to sort of get everyone up and running kind of quickly, we've got this um, this Jupyter Lab Docker image. So, um, Docker is a great little thing for getting software running on other people's computers. Um, so we've kind of in this image that you can just download um, from Docker Hub, we've sort of built in um, some sample Forex data, a sample backtest strategy um, and a JupyterLab install. So you can basically just run this code um, and you'll get a Jupyter notebook with some data in baked into the container um, that you can sort of run and, and kind of get a feel for it. Um, so we, we typically direct people to this because it can be a little bit um, um, scary to open up a, a Nautilus configuration file and, and sort of uh, not sort of know what's going on. So that's kind of like, it's reasonably well documented. Um, I'd also just like to note that they're on, in the repo, there's a whole bunch of examples. So I think there's a live example for all of the adapters that we have. So there's a live interactive brokers, Betfair, FX, FTX, Binance, examples that you can run. All you have to do is plug in your username, password, your API key or whatever. Um, and there are also a, a handful of backtest examples. So um uh, I think there's like six or seven live examples, six or seven back test examples. I think there's an example notebook in there as well, talking through a bit more of, of getting data into Nautilus, which we'll talk about later. Um, yep. So quite a lot of, there are a lot of examples around to sort of get you started. Yeah, and there is a learning curve, I would say, to the platform, but that just comes with the territory with all of the capabilities and flexibility that it has. Uh, and we're continuing to work on the docs. There are docs, um, we'll talk about those at the end, but um, we'll keep adding to them. Writing a strategy, you were gonna talk about this, Brad. Uh, yeah, I can take over here, it's probably, let's, yeah. let's do that. Um, sure. And um, Nikolai, um, yes, it is the, it's the market time. So uh, Nikolai just asked a question about, is it market time, date, et cetera, provided during the backtest run? So what Nautilus does is, um, is basically you we load all of the ticks for um, all of the data that you've requested to for it to run and it basically just steps through that data um, along with if you do any sort of time-based events those events basically just get all merged into one um, you know uh, ascending stream of data that, that Nautilus basically just makes its way through so as you're sort of interacting with the system you're creating time events um, that Nautilus then basically just just steps through um, so hopefully that answers your question and it's always um, unix nanoseconds that's the granularity that's the time currency so to speak yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. So um, now I just want to kind of go again, um, sort of back to a, a user's perspective. So as a, as a first time user of Nautilus, um, you know, how do you actually write a strategy? So the the entry point for all of Nautilus Trader is, is the trading strategy. All of this other stuff that we've talked about so far for a long time, so, oh, quite a while already, um, is, is built around supporting the trading strategy. So um, I just want to step through uh, actually writing a trading strategy and what does it look like? Look like. So um, this is uh, each trading strategy um, has a config. Um, and so in this example, um, I've, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a trading strategy that is... Um, is parameterized by instrument ID, some sort of trade size, and some some other parameters. Um, and so the trading strategy in Nautilus is just a class. So it inherits from strategy and, and takes a single config um, as its argument. And then because this is Python, you, you basically have the flexibility to do whatever you want from here. So um, while Chris has spoken about a lot of Rust and a lot of Cython um, in the platform, the actual um, Python code that a user would write is, is pure Python. So you just whack this in a .py file and attach it to the system and it, it'll just run it. Um, and it's worth so mentioning as well that it can even be easier than what you see here on the slide. This is using a strategy config which really starts setting it up for parameterizing and sending over the wire. 
but you don't have to send a config into the strategy. You can just make it vanilla parameters uh, if you're just going to run back tests locally. Um, That's true. Yeah. So if, yeah. if you have a strategy in this case, I'm, I'm creating this strategy that is really generic over the instrument that it trades, but you may have a, a specific strategy as we will later with the pairs trading example um, that, that doesn't necessarily, it, it may be tied to a particular instrument or kind of instrument. Um, so there's, um, there's a couple of methods that you, you basically will want to implement. So one of them is on start. And so this method gets called when the, after the system has started up and the strategies, we've kind of gotten to a point in the system set up where the strategies will have access to things and they can basically do any sort of startup actions before the whole system sort of kicks off its, um, its main loop, which is either running a back test or starts listening to live data. So this could be things like, um, in this example, I'm, I've passed an instrument ID, which is just a string into the strategy. And I'm going to, I want to pull out the actual instrument objects so that I can do something with that instrument. So I might just pass in, you know, um, Apple on the New York stock exchange. Um, I might pass the stock string in because I don't, I just want to pass a reference to that. But then I hear, I actually want to get the instrument and save a copy of it to do something with later. Um, and the second thing I might do is subscribe to some sort of data. So, um, Nautilus has a bunch of uh, built-in methods for subscribing to things. So you, there's a method for subscribing to quote ticks and trade ticks and bars and other generic data that you may have uh, that you may be feeding into the system. Um, and so the, in the on start is is sort of the time that you would generally do this. Um, you actually can do any of these things at any time. Um, a, a strategy may. Um, for performance reasons, may not do anything for the entirety of the day and only subscribe to quote ticks for the last two minutes of a trading session, for example. So um, again, the, the system really handles this flexibility quite well. Um, and then um, for all of the sort of built-in data types, so quote tick, order book update, trade tick, bar, um, there is an equivalent on you know, this data type method. Um, and so this will pass into pass to your strategy, the actual um, object itself. And so this is kind of like the event driven nature. So the way that you write your trading strategy is you have all of these on something methods. And when this event happens or this piece that you receive this piece of data, you would do some sort of action. So for this particular strategy here, um, what I'm doing is calculating, I'm, I'm subscribing to quote ticks, which is the, the top level of um, this particular instrument that this strategy is parameterized with. And then I'm computing, um, I'm checking the bid and ask volume and computing some sort of ratio. Um, so say there might be 100 shares on the offer, but only 20 shares on the bid. Um, I might think that okay, the, the offer is building up on this thing. And so the bid is going to trade. And so I might want to trigger some sort of order based on that. Um, and so then I might have some check trigger function that then gets called after I've received this quote tick. Um, there's also this generic on event um, method. And so this will contain any sort of execution events. So when you create an order or your order gets accepted by the exchange, so it gets sent over the wire to the exchange and the exchange sends you a response and says, I've accepted your order, you'll get an event. If you get something filled um, and also if you and, and sort of uh, order fill events, then make their way into actual positions. So if you buy 20 shares of Apple, you will also, you'll get an order fill event saying, you know, your order got filled or might've got partially filled, but you also get an update saying that your position in that instrument changed. So a lot of trading strategies will do something on the back of these events. Um, and so on here is just sort of an example of how you would react to an order filled event. Um, is there any questions on strategies at the moment? No, cool. Um, so I'll just just a, a very quick slide on writing an adapter. It's it's effectively the same thing as a strategy. So as Chris mentioned, um, strategies are actors. They are just actors with execution capabilities. So basically, all that I, all the things that I said about on startup and whatnot are, are effectively um, mirrored here. Um, the adapters, can they subscribe to market data? I'm not sure, but um, 
they probably can actually. Um, but I wanted to just go through how you would sort of get external data into Nautilus. Um, so for this example, um, yeah, I've just cover uh, a bit about this. Oh, actually, sorry, excuse me. I'm thinking of actors, not adapters. So uh, ignore everything I just said, excuse me. Um, writing an adapter um, is, an adapter is the interface. I'm just going off a little bit of tangent, excuse me. An adapter is the interface to some sort of external data source. So um, two things that a user might want to do in Nautilus is write a trading strategy and possibly write an adapter. So an adapter would be um, possibly, potentially we can't connect to, or there may not be an adapter for a particular trading venue that you want to trade. So um, if we don't connect to Deribit, for example, or some cryptocurrency exchange or some sports betting platform or so some, some sort of something, you may want to connect to that and you could write that adapter yourself. Um, so I just want to quickly, we'll just quickly go through writing an adapter. This is probably more of, it's more complicated than writing a strategy. Um, but uh, just so people know that, you know, just because it's not defined in the Nautilus Trader open source repo doesn't mean you can't do it yourself. Um, so yeah, adapters, they convert external data or events into Nautilus's format. Um, as mentioned before, they're split into data or execution. So data is, is typically something that just some piece of information flowing into the system and then an execution client or an execution adapter is something that can place orders or, or place trades. Um, and so here is an example of um, what an example might look like if you wanted to write a Twitter adapter. So um, I, I just quickly Googled around and found that Twitter have a, a streaming API. So you could you could connect um, in Python with requests, you could connect to this, um, this streaming API. Um, and uh, basically on your, in your, um, adapters don't have an on start method, they actually have a connect method, um, but it's effectively the same thing. So on your connect method, um, you could create some coroutine here. So this is just, this is sort of asynchronous Python. Um, if you're not familiar with async, it's not super important. You could create a thread or something else here um, to sort of have this, have this operate in the background while not blocking the rest of the system. Um, and so what you would do is in the connection um, method here, you would set up any sort of um, for loop that you want to happen in the background. And so in this scenario, I've connected to um, the, the Twitter stream and I'm just reading data off of this, this stream of HTTP um, posts that are coming to me. And then I'm, I've created a little data subclass. So this is how you would, this is sort of how you instantiate custom data in Nautilus. You subclass data, everything has to have a, a timestamp in it, which is just a, uh, a Unix nanos for when the event actually happened in UTC time. And then you can sort of attach to this piece of data, anything that you want. So um, in our example, we might have, we, we might want to tweet and we might just want to see the text of this and I don't know, do some fancy NLP something, something, or if Elon Musk tweets about something, we might just want to buy. So if we see any sort of stock mentioned in this text, we just fire orders to buy at the exchange. Um, and so this is sort of what it would look like. You would, you would, you would listen to these events. You would then instantiate your, your objects. And then there's just this handle data method on the adapter. And that's basically how you feed data into Nautilus and then Nautilus will take care of routing it um, to any sort of downstream actors or strategies that may be subscribed to that data. And the data engine itself might be subscribed to data for aggregating bars internally. So it may flow to internal components as well. Via yep, that's, us. yep, that's right. Um, market data flows to the, to the cache and the portfolio and various things. So yeah. Um, um, I'm going to just speed over this uh, quite quickly um, because we're probably running a little bit behind on time, maybe. Um, so, so we've sort of spoken about custom data and Nautilus and backtesting and things. So the, the, I think the next question for a lot of people is like, okay, um, I've got X, Y, Z data from somewhere. Either you've saved some data, you've found some online or, or whatever. Um, how... 
do I get that data into Nautilus? Um, and so it's it's like everything in Nautilus, there's a little bit of configuration required to get up and running. Um, but basically the reason that that is, is uh, Nautilus gets its performance from its strict typing. So um, there's, a, there's a tiny bit of work to, to get your data into Nautilus, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's worth it for the correctness and the, and the speed and things. So um, I'll just go through a couple of options quickly. So I'm assuming here that you've got some CSV file of open, high, low, closed data, or you've got some trade ticks, or you've got some order book data from somewhere. You basically have two options. Um, the first one is are the Wranglers. And so the Wranglers are um, uh, classes that allow you to load quote ticks or trade ticks um, from some sort of CSV or Parquet file or pandas and convert those on the fly into Nautilus objects. So what would happen is you would, in your back test, you would say, okay, I've got this CSV file of data and you would point the Wrangler at it and say, okay, this is the columns that, that you know, equate to open, high, low, close or the bid and ask price or a trade tick. And the Wrangler will sort of convert that on the fly into Nautilus types. So um, I would say that, while people are experimenting with Nautilus, this is a great way to get up and running um, because it's quick and it's even suitable if you've got hourly or end of day data, the Wranglers probably are fine because if you've got less than, say, a million events that you want to run a backtest over, the Wranglers, you won't notice any performance hit um, from using them. Um, and the second option is the data catalog. So this is something we added to Nautilus, I don't know, six months ago. Um, and this is basically the, the more work, but the performance choice. Um, so it, it's effectively the same thing as the Wranglers, except you'll pass your data um, through sort of a Wrangler and Nautilus will then write this in a particular, will write your data um, into Parquet, basically optimized for how Nautilus likes to read the data. So you kind of have this loading step that you do separately to your back test. Um, and, and, and we sort of pack all of your data into a bunch of Parquet files such that Nautilus can read it faster um, and, and in an in sort of an efficient sort of manner. So it's worth mentioning there that loading data is currently the biggest bottleneck for the platform. Um, when considering an end-to-end -end back test from loading data to getting the results at the end. So it is something we're working on right now, actually, and we'll be using uh, a, Rust, a Rust implementation of Parquet to load those structs that Scython is wrapping, and it should happen um, at least an order of magnitude faster, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. Um, and so the data catalog is, is built on this great Python library called um, FSSpec, um, which has a bunch of implementations for sort of um, getting your data and saving your data anywhere that you would want to save it. So if you have S3, an S3 bucket on AWS, or you've got an ST, SFTP server or GCS or wherever you sort of have your data, um, uh, the data catalog is able to read and write move that data around um, and uh, quite easily. So if you had 50 terabytes of tick data that you've got in some S3 bucket in AWS, um, Nautilus can sort of process that. It's, it's, it's quite easy. Um, cool. Okay, so now I'll hand back over to Chris sure. um, for running back tests. Okay. Here we are. So we're going to talk a little bit about configuration. Uh, what this is leading up to is a demo of a backtest actually running. Uh, it's one of the examples in the repository. So it does require a bit of configuration to set up a backtest. Um, and it's just necessary because of all the capabilities and flexibility that the platform has. Um, and it can be done in a couple of ways. So the way that we're going to see through the example is basically like a Python uh, launch script, uh, which just gathers all the um, configuration together and uh, runs a, a, what's called a backtest engine, which is quite a low level object. Uh, there is another way of doing it using a backtest run config, which is a higher level concept. Um, and it utilizes this data catalog that Brad's been speaking about. So we'll be walking through one of the examples and exactly the same configuration applies to backtest run config. We, we do have some slides on that coming up as well. 
So first of all, we need to create a backtest engine. Um, and down inside the engine is where that core lives, that Nautilus kernel. So we pass to this engine, a backtest engine config. Uh, that shares a lot of common um, fields with a trading node config for live trading. The only required parameter here is a trader, trader ID. Um, and that is to uniquely identify the trader instance um, and the default backtester 001. I won't get into uniqueness of IDs. Um, okay, so next we need to add some instruments, what we're actually trading. So ETH US dollar T, Binance is a spot instrument. So we instantiating this through a test instrument provider. So this class actually um, is utilized by a lot of the uh, test suite. Um, so we're basically just pulling out a stub instrument that's already been instantiated. And we're adding that instrument to the engine with the dot add instrument method. Um, and there's a few other ways that you can instantiate these instruments. So if one doesn't currently exist and you want to trade this instrument, it's almost like, think of it like a contract specification for a futures product. Um, you just instantiate the instrument and pass all the parameters to it that you, that, that you need to. Um, or you can use a test instrument provider if, if we already have one that you need. Um, you can load them through the data catalog. So they may be persisted in Parquet. Uh, you may have previously persisted a bunch of instruments that you've been working with, or they can be loaded directly from an adapter. So part of the data client is what's called an instrument provider. And so you can actually use the live Binance instrument provider to discover um, crypto instruments to trade without having to manually figure out all of the parameters that make up that instrument. You're actually using the real thing uh, for both backtests and live. So now we need to add actual data to the engine. Um, so we'll be using a Wrangler for this, a uh, bit of a lower level object. So we're basically just loading up some uh, ticks from a CSV file. So we're grabbing a, a, a provider, instantiating a provider, uh, calling .read CSV ticks, passing a relative path to the file, and we're passing that raw data to the Wrangler for processing, along with uh, this instrument. So that the ticks that are produced are going to be uh, correctly defined in terms of uh, their precision, um, and then adding those ticks to the engine. So that on that last line there, engine.addData, that's a very flexible method. You can basically add any type of data. So what do I mean by that? Any object or list of objects that inherit from the data class is valid data. I'll just jump in here, just, yep. sorry, Chris, just really quickly. Um, so this is just kind of echoing what I said about before. This is probably the way in which most people will load their data into Nautilus um, to begin with. So typically when you have a CSV file of data, you might have trade ticks or something. Um, the reason that we've got to specify an instrument here is often those files will just have like an instrument ID um, or, or some, maybe not even an instrument ID. You might have these saved in folders with an instrument ID and just a bunch of trade ticks without any sort of identifier. So um, that's why we've got to pass the instrument to the Wrangler. Um, but this is typically how, if, if you didn't have your data in the data catalog, um, you would load some, some sort of data into, into Nautilus. Yep. So every one of those ticks will carry with it an instrument ID um, and not just the, you know, the, the bid and ask. Um, okay, so define venues. This will create a simulated exchange. Okay, so a venue is a type of identifier. So we're instantiating a Binance venue and we're now setting up a simulated Binance venue with the engine. So using the dot add venue method, um, we briefly covered this uh, OMS order management system without diving into that. It's, it's netting for Binance. Um, all orders are netted together into the same position. Account type cash, so this is the spot market that we're trading. Base currency, there's no base currency, it's a multi-asset wallet. And adding some starting balances, so we've got a million Tether and 10 ETH. Okay, and finally getting there, uh, we're setting up a config for the EMA cross. So 
The repo comes with some example strategies and one of them is an EMA cross, very simple concept. Uh, so we can parameterize that for the instrument we're trading, the, the bar type, so it runs on bars for simplicity. This is actually quite a good feature of the platform. So you can see this string here, ethus.t.binance, that's the instrument, and it's a 250 tick last internal bar. So it's based on 250 ticks of, of aggregated data, last meaning trades. So it's gonna be 200, 250 trade ticks and internal is internally aggregated as opposed to externally, say at the venue itself, because Binance does publish bars of various uh, specs, various time periods. Trade size, how much ETH we're gonna trade, um, the fast and slow EMA parameters and this order ID tag. So this is necessary for all strategies just to uniquely identify the strategy um, with a simple tag that can be appended to order IDs to keep everything in line. So we can now instantiate a strategy, EMA cross pass at the config and then add it to the engine with the add strategy method. And finally run the back test. So all we have to do now that all the config is in there, all the data is in there, strategies in there. We can call dot run on the engine. Uh, that will run all of that data through the system, uh, and we can produce various reports. So you'll automatically get some uh, performance statistics for the back test, but we can generate more granular uh, account reports, auto fill reports, position reports. There's quite a few things you can do, um, and these last two lines are just showing. Uh, setting the engine to different states. So resetting the engine, you could then call dot run again, and it would just run again over the same data. Uh, you can manipulate various things with the engine though, um, but before running it again. So it's quite flexible. Um, so these dot reset and dot dispose, um, every component uh, has this base class component. And there's a finite state machine, which will ensure that the state transitions are correct. Um, and so that last line about good practice to dispose an object, that's a terminal state once the, the component is disposed. It's part of how the trading node can um, start up and shut down gracefully, even though it's, it's quite a complex um, symphony of async code and, and components running on a single event loop with UV loop. Uh, it all works quite well with no warnings, uh, partly because of this, um, these state machines keeping everything uh, correct. Okay. Just, um, sorry, Chris, I was jumping jump in on this one. Yeah. No, 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 it's all right. Uh, I'm just on the on the previous slide. So um, yeah. one one reason um, why you might um, reset the engine um, is if you were, I saw um, Nikolai just asked about changing parameter values. One instance where you might do a reset um, as opposed to creating a whole other instance is if you were doing some sort of grid search over parameters. So reset would effectively um, clear the state of the engine except for the data that you've put in there. So if you've done some wrangling and you've loaded up sort of like a, a back test run full of tick data, reset would clear your orders, your positions, all of that sort of thing, but leave the back test engine ready to run again. So yeah. if you were doing some sort of parameter search, that's what you would do. So it essentially clears all the state yep. that leaves yep. what you want, which is that data in place, ready to go again. Unless you call clear data, I think the method is. Um, do you want to talk about the run config, Brad? Um, yeah, I can talk about that quickly, and I'll just pick up a couple of these questions on the way through as well. Um, yeah. So, um, Song Su, the the trade size, um, it's it, you can parameterize this in any sort of way that you want. So, the question is, is the trade size fixed, um, or can it be changed with respect to the account balance? So, the the parameters that you have on your trading strategy are are totally arbitrary. They can be whatever you want. So, um, if you wanted to do um, uh, something as a as a proportion of your account balance, what you would do is just parameterize your strategy as a proportion and then inside of your strategy you would you would do the computation to figure out what your order size might be and that would be quite easy because you can access your account balance at any time quite easily um, and also uh, any sort of orders that you may have in the market or positions that you might currently have um, and um, Alex I'm not quite sure about what you mean by that is it aware of each of the orders 
Um, <laughs> so, so if I'm running a strategy live, as I yep. send the order to the exchange, yep. um, does it actually um, understand what the status of that order is, whether it's been accepted or rejected? Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, so you, you'll you get the, the order makes its way through a very, very um, a, a long order state. So when yeah. you create the order, it'll be initialized. Then when it gets sent over the wire, when it leaves Nautilus, it'll be submitted. If we get an accept or reject, that'll get updated. Um, and then it can be part filled, filled or whatever. So there are, yeah, every conceivable status that your order goes through, you'll have access to and you'll get event updates on. So you can also create orders um, sort of ahead of time if you wanted to without submitting them. So there's, there's lots of flexibility and correctness around that. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. It's also protected from duplicate fills, duplicate event applications or say a rejected order or cancelled order suddenly coming to life again through some sort of bug. Yeah. Uh, the platform won't allow that to happen. It will give yeah. an error. Yeah, nice. Good, good question. Thanks, Alex. Um, and so, yeah, just quickly, the, the back we have this also this backtest run config, which is a pydantic um, model. Um, it's kind of just all of the steps that we went through before, but just in one big class. Um, so, and this is a, this is, uh, uses the data catalog um, and is more applicable if you wanted to say load um, some configuration from a JSON or a YAML file. Um, you could do that via this object, but you would kind of configure everything in one big go as opposed to incrementally. Uh, and the, the only provisor, the only um, requirement here is that it, you can only use it with the data catalog, unfortunately, because it is just one big string. And so um, yeah, everything sort of has to be known ahead of time. Um, and so we just skip to the next slide, Chris. Uh, there's just a quick sure. example oh, yeah. of the, the back test. Keep going. Uh, this is just a quick example of how you would instantiate at, a, at, a, at the very, very highest level um, a back test run in the same way that we did before, but with the back test run config. Um, you'll notice here that there's the engine config, the venues config, the data config. Um, so effectively all the things we've done before, just in a, in a slightly more high level object, um, which people may prefer to work with, um, if they get their data into the catalog. The other thing the backtest node can do second last line is it can take a list of configs. So it's going to create an engine for every single set of configuration that you have, um, and then produce a list of backtest results based on those. So now we're starting to get into this parameterized, um, grid optimized type search um, use case. And that's really what that's set up for. Nice. Um, yeah, so live we can yeah, do a live um, demo now.